Hello, and welcome to Across the Genres, the World of Children's Publishing. This special panel is brought to you in partnership with the Ohio Anna Library and the 2020 Ohio Anna Book Festival, which will be taking place virtually August 28th through 30th. I'm Katherine Powers, the Regional Advisor for the Central and Southern Ohio Chapter of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, which is a very long name, which we happily shortened to SCBWI. I'm also the office manager of the Ohio Anna Library, and I'm thrilled to bring my two favorite organizations together this evening. So, and as you can see, I'm wearing my book festival t-shirt this evening. <laughs> so, for anyone new to the world of children's literature, SVWI is the world's largest professional organization for children's writers and illustrators. The organization includes members from all over the world and at all points in their publishing careers from beloved best-selling authors to writers and illustrators just dipping their toes into the kidlit industry. I've been a member since 2008, and personally it has given me so much craft and industry knowledge, as well as a truly wonderful community. In non-COVID times, our Central and Southern Ohio chapter holds in-person meetings each month in Columbus, Cincinnati, and Dayton. However, with COVID and social distancing and all that fun stuff, we've now been holding one online meeting for our entire chapter each month and plan to continue doing so through at least this fall. So this is why we're all gathered here tonight for our August chapter meeting. Before we get started, I want to thank the Ohioana Book Festival sponsors and partners, all of whom you can find listed on the Ohioana website. And also a special thanks to the official festival bookseller, The Book Loft of German Village. You can get all the books featured on this panel and featured at the festival by going online to bookloft.com. And now I'm very pleased to welcome our guests, Ohio authors and illustrators, Kristen Lindsay Hager, Aiko Ikigami, Samuel Narr, and Julie Rubini. And for brief introductions to get us started, so alphabetically, Kristen first. Kristen Lindsay Hager writes about friendship, self-esteem, fitting in, frenemies, crushes, fame, first loves, and values. Her work has been featured in many publications, including USA Today and her debut novel, True Colors, won the Reader's Favorite Award for Best Preteen Book. She joins us tonight from Dayton. Aiko Ikigami was born in Tokyo, Japan and moved to the U.S. in 1993. After receiving a PhD in pharmacology and working as a, I always mess this word up, <laughs> neuropharmacologist, <laughs> which sounds super impressive, she returned to her childhood love of drawing, painting, and creating stories. She joins us tonight from Columbus. Samuel Narr grew up in Ghana, West Africa, immersed in folk tales from the African continent. He enjoys using words to paint beautiful stories with messages to enrich the lives of both young children and adults. He joins us tonight from Columbus. And Julie K. Rubini is a children's book author, literacy advocate, and co-founder of Claire's Day, which is Northwest Ohio's largest children's book festival and was created in honor of their daughter. Julie writes primarily nonfiction for middle grade and high school readers. She joins us tonight from Toledo. So thank you all again for joining us tonight. You are a truly talented bunch and I am so grateful to know all of you. So to get us started, can you all tell us a little bit about your book festival title? We'll just start alphabetically with Kristen. Okay, I think he went with um, In Over Her Head, Likes Camera Anxiety. Yes, book two of the Cecily series. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, well, what I wanted to do with um, that book is to take a teenager and give her everything she thinks she wants. Fame, a chance to be an actress, um, dating the singer, that she, songwriter that she's had a crush on for forever that she thinks she has a connection to, give her everything she thinks she wants, thinks that she needs, and watch her try to survive in that world and see what it's really like to have all your dreams come true. So we have her dealing with anxiety, dealing with different levels of fame, being a celebrity's girlfriend, and trying her chops out at acting for the first time and how that goes. And I go. Yes, um, the book is called Hello, and it's uh, my uh, first non-war picture book. So there's no. Oh, can you move a little closer again? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me well? Yes. Now that's better. <laughs> so it's a um, it's a wordless picture book, 
and uh, it's about a friendship of uh, alien and uh, um, human <laughs> and uh, it's a deep it's um it's de depicted that uh, we can be friend even without word in this world yeah <laughs> wonderful thank you and samuel Macy's scrapbook is about cultural diversity within a family. More or less, we are all like Macy because no two parents are culturally identical to one another. I wrote Macy's scrapbook because I'm originally from Ghana and my wife is from Mississippi. Even though we are racially similar to each other, we are culturally very different from each other. And Macy's scrapbook is more about how the different cultures mold a child. Wonderful, thank you. And Julie, a little bit about your book, please. Sure, um, cover, here we go, reverse. Psychology, why we smile, strive and sing um, is all about why we do the things we do. And it's written for teens and about teens and it was a very different title for me having written last three books for biographies for middle grade audiences but I've always been intrigued as to you know how is it that we respond to situations and challenges and opportunities and so Nomad Press was exploring this for their readers for their inquire and investigate series and Andy Bean the editor had reached out to me to see if I would be interested based on my life experiences in um, writing this for teens. And it was a fabulous journey through science and talking to neurologists and psychologists to um, get some input as to really why is it that teenagers make the decisions that they do and the choices that they do. And the, the um, studies that are being done, especially with um, brain activity, teenagers' brain activities, it's just it's really fascinating. It's really fun to explore and write. That sounds super fascinating. And it just came out uh, just a couple days ago, right? On the 15th? <laughs> book birthday, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so very happy book birthday to you. Thank you. So um, a question for everybody, and we'll go in reverse alphab alph alphabetical order this time. So we'll start with Julie. So everyone's path to publication story is different. Can you tell us a little bit about yours? Yeah, I think everybody's story is very non-traditional, if you will. There's just... <laughs> And, and mine in particular, as you mentioned, I'm, um, my husband and I established Claire's Day at Children's Book Festival in honor of our little reader gone too soon. And I began to befriend children's book authors and illustrators from Ohio, Michigan, Indiana. Um, my background is in marketing and sales, but I had also been doing quite a bit of freelance writing. So just from the communication, I apparently can can write a pretty persuasive email. So they said, you're, you're a writer. We need to, they literally, I say, they drew me into their world, which is hats off to the illustrators. But um, yeah, it was, so I became familiar with SDBWI and uh, ultimately through a connection at Claire's Day and Margaret Lewis is both an author as well as she and her husband had a um, press up in Michigan, Mackinac Island Press, and they were looking for an Ohio writer to write this great picture book about Ohio called Hidden Ohio. And um, I met her at Claire's Day and I spoke about writing it at our Claire's Night function, our New Year's Eve Claire's Day. And uh, she said the proverbial light bulb went on for her. She thought, well, gosh, Julie, my background's in tourism and hospitality and and uh, so Julie would probably be great for that. And again, that was a very unique opportunity. And um, I was, when I do school visits, I ask children whether, uh, how they thought I responded to that phone call to say, would you like to write it? And, and they say, of course, you're excited. And I said, yes, I was excited. And they said, happy, yes, I was happy. I said, how about scared? Do you think I was scared? And they're like, no, and I'm like, yes, I was scared. It was a new opportunity and I think it taught me that we always need to be open to those opportunities. And consequently, um, the other opportunities, the three biographies for Ohio University Press, them from a connection through SCBWI, um, through Michelle Houts, who is a mutual friend who serves as the series editor. And um, 
same thing. She thought I would be great at writing that. And I walked away thinking, holy moly, I, I've never written a middle group. And um, so, so I wrote those three. And then again, the, the connections through SCDWI and the writing. And I think the more that we create, um, the more that um, editors become aware of us. And having said that, I um, have not had an agent up until um, I now have an agent. I have my next work out on submission. So fingers crossed. Um, it's a great story um, about amazing female athletes and an incredible accomplishment that still is um, very prevalent in the world of sports. And um, so I've got it out on submission. So that was kind of a cool journey to finally get an agent as well. Exciting. Yeah. Excellent. And how about Samuel? Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, road to publication story? Okay. My entrance into the children's book industry was very accidental. I've always known since I was a child that I'll write a book, but I never thought it would be a children's book. Someone once said, when you have a child, you see the world very differently. I never believed in that until I had a child. So when we had our daughter, I started seeing the world from her point of view. I wanted to find a book that she could see me and my wife and her in that book. I looked all over the market and I didn't really find any book that really met that criteria and I decided to write a book. So that's why I was saying my entrance into the children's book industry was very accidental. And fortunately, I was able to find a publisher who specializes in diverse and multicultural books, Lantana Publishing in the United Kingdom, who was very interested in this book and now we have Macy's Scrub book. Fantastic. And yes. Heiko, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Yes, um, I, I always wanted to, I love, since childhood, I loved drawing and making the stories. And I always wanted to create picture books. But somehow I, as I grew up, grew up I started, um, shift from the, the idea and I became scientist. And then when I was, when I was writing dissertation for my uh, PhD, I, real, I just remember how much I loved writing. <laughs> it's so strange, but uh, yeah, then I, um, one day I have decided to go back and I started seriously taking um, classes and workshop and uh, one of that is Mark, Mark's class. It's Mark's and Splash online class, which is wonderful. It's like, um, it's, um, it's for um, those who want to be illustrator or for children's books. It's A to Z. <laughs> and then also Cindy Ryder's class and um, then I, um, I, I was very fortunate to be able to find an agent for my book. And um, she's still my agent. <laughs> and we have a long, uh, long relationship with her. Uh, she's Anna Olswanga, literacy mm -hmm. agent. And so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. And yes, you're a very wonderful, nice person. <laughs> I've seen her on uh, online things before. So. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, Kristen, if you could tell us a little bit about your journey. Sure. Well, um, I always knew I wanted to write a book. I just didn't know like what it all would entail. So I was the nerd in college who kept taking extra English classes, even when I filled my requirements, because I was learning and I was getting more confidence and I kept going. And my dad just sort of rolled his eyes at it and just was like, all right, fine. You're actually learning something. You're getting something out of it. We'll just let this go. And um, I kept going to writing conferences. I was doing TV internships, writing for newspapers, all while I was learning. Um, I joined SCBWI in 2001. And that was kind of like um, 
a, b a big step for me because I had to like go and you have to do the conference critiques and stuff like that. I had done some professional critiques at the um, Detroit Women's Writers Group because I used to be in Michigan and just kind of learning along the way, sending things out. Um, grad school helped with that because I was doing independent studies and stuff. So I was getting feedback all the time. So several of the books that are out now have been rewritten several times because as you go through the process and everything um, and just doing a lot of workshops and things like that and um, networking, meeting, you know, people at these conferences and stuff, it forces you to get out of your comfort zone. And I think I credit journalism with a lot of that because you learn how to put a story together. You're meeting people. You're realizing that everybody has a story. You're learning different perspectives. And I think that really helped me too as well. And plus working with the professors, they gave me um, confidence, you know, kind of gave me direction. And I joined this um, in grad school, this writing class, or actually children's literature class. And most of the people in the class were going to be teachers or professors. And I was the only person who was a writer, but I let the professor know that that's why I was taking it. And so for my final, she had me turn in a couple chapters of something I was working on. And that wasn't nerve wracking or anything because she wanted more chapters than I had. And so that was kind of a big step for me and showed me, you know, how much I could get done and, you know, waiting on that feedback too and kind of knowing you're on the right path. That was really what helped me is doing the classes, the conferences and all of that. And then eventually you just keep sending out and learning more and more. You realize where your strengths are or you need to, you know, build things up and stuff and, you know, just keeping at it and stuff like that. And then finally one day you get that first yes and you finally get that weight off your shoulders. It's awesome. And all the uh, getting uh, that feedback as well helps build up your dragon skin to get ready to submit it to everybody later on as well. As do the comments when you're a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very well so. So this is a question for Aiko and Samuel both. So you were born in Japan and Ghana respectively. Are there many differences between the publishing industry and children's books in your native countries compared to America? that you know about? And either of you can answer <laughs> first. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to answer first? Sure. <laughs> okay. As I said, I didn't have any knowledge about children's book or the industry until maybe four years ago before I had my daughter. In Ghana, we have an oral tradition, you know, storytelling is part of our culture. So I grew up listening to a lot of, you know, different stories from all across Africa and also across the world. But the industry in Ghana, as far as I know, is, is similar to the industry in the U.S. Not as big as the U.S., but it's also similar. You have to write a book which is you know, sellable, which is marketable, and you have to write it in, in a way that fits into the cultural context when it comes to storytelling in Ghana. But apart from that, I think it's, it's very similar to what you have here in the U.S. Excellent. Should I? And Aiko? <laughs> Sorry, something weird just happened on my screen, but now I can see you guys again. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I have no experience publishing in Japan, so I cannot really answer the question, but looking at the industry in Japan, it's, um, it's just like um, Samyeon said, it's similar to the United States, but for me, it's somehow the aim is a little bit um, different. Uh, in Japan, um, children's picture books are not for only children. Adult loves the picture books too. Oh. So uh, <laughs> coffee shops, uh, like beautiful coffee shops that adult, adult like uh, or grown-up goes, and there's a full of picture books that they read. <laughs> so um, it's it's not. Um, clear distinction between, oh, this is the story for children, age 
like five to eight, six to eleven. Um, no, it's for everybody. So um, I think it's, it's 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 good. But other than that, it's uh, I think it's similar. Um, yes, thank you. That's wonderful. I know if uh, for probably most of the kid lit folks here, um, either on screen or in the audience, as you can see our bookshelves behind us, they are full of kids books. <laughs> so <laughs> definitely at least the writers here in America love their kids books and can't get enough of them, even if it says, you know, for, for ages, you know, three to five or anything like that. It's, it's for all of us. <laughs> so um, this is a question for Julie specifically. So um, with your festival title, as well as your biographies for young reader series, which I will say is um, actually one of my favorite nonfiction series, uh, the, just the whole series is just fantastic through the um, Ohio University Press, and you have done three of those. So um, for writing your nonfiction, how do you go about choosing your subject matter? Is it something that um, usually the publisher comes to you with an idea, or um, do you just pursue things that happen to interest you? Great question. I've had experiences from both perspectives, both the picture book Hidden Ohio and the psychology book uh, originated with the publisher. Um, you know, concept, I had certainly a lot of input as far as the content. Um, psychology, particularly, I was able to, they had a chapter outline already established, and um, but I added the chapter on the teenage brain. They did not want to have a chapter specifically de dedicated to what's happening you know, physically to a teenager's brain, which is really important since it's written for the teenagers. And, and obviously the brain is a huge component as far as why we do the things we do. But the um, three biographies for Ohio University Press, I had um, the pleasure in uh, providing the subjects, proposing the subjects to Ohio University Press and their editorial board. And um, for each one of them as nonfiction, Nonfiction sells on proposal. So the entire book is not written, um, but there are generally a proposal consists of certain components, including um, three chapters, generally a chapter outline, basically why this subject story should be told and why I should be the one to tell the story. Um, the proposal I have out on submission now is 70 pages long. So proposals, nonfiction proposals are pretty substantial in their self. It's not the whole book, but you have to have the vision. Um, so in the case of all three of my subjects, the first being Millie Dunson, who is the original ghostwriter of Nancy Drew uh, mystery stories, her story had never been told for any audience. And uh, I felt then and failed to have proven that readers of all ages, Nancy Drew fans of all ages, have been reading that book. And it's so fun to see, you know, how it's scattered across in, in libraries across the country, across the world. Um, the second subject, uh, there had been biographies written about the amazing Virginia Hamilton, the most honored author of children's literature ever. I have long admired her work, uh, read her work to our kids. Um, you know, she just, she was across the spectrum. She was picture books, she was fantasy, she was science fiction, she was, you know, but she was predominantly a middle grade writer and she was the first African American to win the Newbery Medal in 1975. And yet there had not been a biography written for those middle grade readers about Virginia Hamilton. And then um, the third, Christine Brennan, is the USA Today sports journalist and you know, still alive and well and, you know, unfortunately not at the Olympics this year for the first time since 1984. Um, what Christine has done to break down the barriers for female sports journalists was just an incredible story. And I've known Christine for a long time, so it was great to share her story. So I felt very honored that the Ohio University Press had the confidence that, um, that these stories needed to be told and that I should be the one to tell them. So it was a, it was a great journey. It really is an honor. Fantastic. So, and here is a question for Kristen. So while your festival title is book two in your Cecily Taylor Young Adult series, you also publish middle grade fiction with the Landry's True Color series. What are some differences between these age groups? And when you are brainstorming a new story, how do you decide if you should write it as a middle grade or a YA book? 
Well, first of all, I just want to say I love Nancy Drew, and I've been following the journalist Christine's work because I love figure skating, so I'm very excited for you, Julie. <laughs> I'm looking forward to read those. I just had to say that. Um, well, when I started out, um, and my first book that I wrote that I knew would ever see the public, not the first one I ever wrote, because your first book's kind of sometimes a test pancake, um, was YA. But then when I wrote True Colors, which was the first one that got published, um, I knew that it was going to be a little bit younger because of the age um, group that I wanted to hit, the, the middle grade readers. Mine's sometimes called upper middle grade, sometimes like for contests, so that's the prize I end up getting. Um, and really what it is is how their worlds are different. And really the best way to look at it, like you can read on a list of what, you know, Writer's Digest or something puts out, but the best way to look at it is how you were at that age. And really go back and remember, don't look at it as an adult, looking at what a kid's going through, go back and remember how you were how you know going to school that was your whole world anything that happened at home wasn't even as big as what happened at school something happened you know after lunch some, you know they, they called it recess in my day i don't know if they say even now um but if it happened and it was embarrassing or you know traumatic it was your whole world it was huge and so you have to keep everything like that and think about that with the character what they're going through to the day and because the school background is so big, sometimes in middle grade, you will see more stuff in the classroom. Whereas in YA, they're in school somewhat, yes, but that's not the main focus. The main focus is more stepping out a little bit outside of getting to their independence. So, so they're stepping a little bit outside of from their parents and those kind of relationships and going to, you know, if they're in a romantic relationship, if they have a crush. Um, just kind of the independence thing, like with the friendships, figuring out who they are, where they fit in. Whereas middle grade, they're more just trying to fit in. They're not necessarily trying to figure out, you know, their independence. They're trying to be more like somebody. And they might have a crush, they might have a first love, but the romantic relationship doesn't really take off in the same way as with a young adult one. You're dealing with a lot more emotions. And if the person, you know, if the popularity is different, you know, the social economic level is different. All those things have changed. So when I start to write a book, I don't necessarily think, is this going to be middle grade, is this going to be young adult? The a subject matter and the character comes to me. Like my mother always says, can you come up with a better way of saying it other than I hear voices in my head? But basically I hear the character talk to me and I start hearing dialogue and then I just start writing the dialogue down. And sometimes that first dialogue ends up being the very beginning of the book because somebody has a story that they want to tell. And sometimes when I'm writing it, I know where I'm going with it. Sometimes I know like where I want to get to, but the age kind of just comes with as the dialogue. You know, I realized very early on, this is a teenager talking. Is this somebody in like middle school? Um, so it, it kind of just kind of comes together all at once. It's never the thing where I'm thinking, oh, do I need to change this to tweak this for a middle grade market? Um, I try to do it more organic that way and just have it come naturally because I'm not trying to skew to try to, hit a certain market, because then kids, kids could tell. An adult will read a book, things might not you know, be kosher, they, they might even be a little off, they'll continue to read it. A kid can tell if you're not being authentic and will put that book down and you're not getting that reader back. <laughs> <laughs> huh. That's great. Definitely, I think writing is probably the only profession where it's a good thing if you hear uh, voices in your head. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell my mom I said that, though, okay? <laughs> but it's so true. <laughs> you can tell her that. You can tell her that the, the other writers agree with you next time. <laughs> <laughs> I have company. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, this question is for Samuel. So Maisie's scrapbook is such a heartwarming story about a multicultural family, and the illustrations are gorgeous, too. Did you collaborate with the illustrator, Joe Loring Fisher, on all the folklore and cultural details that she incorporated in the pictures? Or is that something that she just uh, researched and uh, put it on her own? Or was that more of a collaboration? Okay, so Macy's Scrapbook was my first picture book. And it was also Joe's first picture book. And uh, the story, had to be authentic. And the elements of the story are very Ghanaian. You know, the story of Anansi, the spider, and about, you know, the kind of food um, Macy's dad likes, the kind of clothing he likes, the 
there are some war hangings in the book, which in Ghana we call the Adenkra symbols, you know. So I had to guide Joe to get it culturally right because, I mean, she's from the UK and she's not really exposed to Ghanaian stories. She didn't know anything about Anansi the Spider, so I had to tell her about Anansi the Spider. I had to tell her um, the significance of Anansi in Ghanaian oral tradition. And we had to work together, you know, sending her pictures, you know, talking to her online, you know, collaborating with the publisher because the owner of Lantana Publishing actually lived in Ghana for um, a few years. So Alice knew something about the Ghanaian culture. We worked together, the three of us, to make sure the story was authentic because it has to be balanced. And for it to be balanced, I had to guide her into getting the elements right. That is uh, really wonderful and helpful to hear. I know that has been a very large uh, conversation in the children's publishing industry um, for the past few years um, is how writers and illustrators um, can make sure that stories are authentic, um, you know, whether yeah. they are the um, from that culture or, um, you know, doing research about that culture and all those sort of aspects. Yeah, so, yeah that's, that's great to hear. So um, a question now for Ico. Um, so for Ico, hello is your first wordless picture book. Was this process any different than how you go about creating your picture books with text? Um, actually, no, because no. <laughs> <laughs> it started out with a picture book with words. And then in um, there are so many rejections from publishers, and then um, it took a long time, and then so many revisions with my agent uh, who helped, helped me, and then as the process of like um, uh, listening to the editor's comment, it's just uh, somehow it became one less book. So it was just a natural process to become wordless. So there, were, there wasn't really dif uh, differences between. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, a question for Kristen, Aiko, and Julie. Um, and Julie talked about this a little bit already, um, but you are all members of SBWI. So we were wondering if you could talk about how SBWI has been an influence on your journeys and careers. <laughs> and any of you can go. We, how about let's start with Ico this time. <laughs> yeah, um, no, it's um, for, for my, it's to be a member of SCBWI, it's just helped me to, it has so many um, wonderful tips in the um, newsletters and like guide and also the, there's an illustration contest and it's mentally stimulating and it's also very instructional and it's, um, um, I would love to attend more meetings, which is difficult <laughs> right now, but uh, yeah. And then I tend to forget uh, to renew my membership. <laughs> so it happens. <laughs> I, I hope there's a somehow notice to renew. <laughs> Someday I just uh, stop receiving the newsletters and then like, oh, oh. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. hard for us to all even know what day of the week it is, so I don't think anybody expects anybody to <laughs> be up to date with memberships and things like that right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. so wonderful. Uh, how about Kristen? Well, like I said, I joined in 2001, and the first uh, meeting I went to, or um, actually it was a conference, was my first time. 
And I had gone to um, Barnes and Noble at that time and had like a little test thing. And so I met a couple authors before I went in, a couple picture book authors. And I went in and I wasn't supposed to have a critique. I was in line, a wait list for a critique. And I found out that day that, oh, guess what? You're getting a critique with an editor. And I'd only written a couple chapters of True Colors, my middle grade novel. And I was nervous. I mean, you know, I talk about my Landry having, you know, stomach with clog dancing butterflies. I had clog dancing butterflies. I was so nervous, but it was so helpful. Um, the critique wasn't like anything I'd had in a critique group because the editor's mind works a lot differently. Your critique group, sometimes they critique like readers, but the editor, they just see stuff that never would have occurred to you, never came up in your critique groups and stuff like that. And so it was eye-opening. It was just really, really a great experience. And she asked for a full, and all I had was what I gave her. <laughs> but that gave me the confidence. I thought, wow, she actually thinks there's something there. Um, but the funny thing was, is she was telling me, she's like, well, I really love your voice, it's authentic. You have to keep going with this and everything. And I made a com, a joke. I said, oh, I guess, you know, being a loser in middle school paid off, ha ha. She goes and to do her big, huge thing in the auditorium. So not the separate groups in the auditorium. And she says, I'm not going to say who it is, but it's a big editor. You know her name. She says, oh, and I heard the greatest comment. Being a loser paid off in middle school. You know, Kristen, where are you? Could you stand up? She said that. And I had to stand up in front of an auditorium and my first big SBWI conference and say, hi, I'm the one who was a loser <laughs> in middle school. But after that, it broke the ice. I met more people. Um, you just, you meet a lot of people, the critiques, just learning, seeing other people's experience. And when you've been in the group a long time too, it's so refreshing seeing people, you know, as they're sending things out, um, seeing the same faces, you know, I've changed because being military, we've moved a lot and stuff and still meeting people in different groups. So I've met so many people from different, you know, SCBWIs for a while. I was on the um, listserv for the UK and for France and everything and just seeing how the groups are different um, and just you know learning so much. I got to see Richard Peck speak and so much of what he said, this is when um, SCBWI had the conference in Grand Rapids, so much of what he says I still tell people today when they ask me for like you know writing advice and stuff about putting the manuscript aside. I remember he said for a year, put it in a drawer for a year and everyone in the auditorium went, <laughs> you know, like what? <laughs> but it's true to get fresh eyes on it, to edit, you do need to put it aside for a while. And I know that's not the trend right now because books, people want books coming out, you know, so often, but he was so right on that coming at something with fresh eyes. And see, that's not something necessarily you might find in, you know, any of the writing books that I was reading. Wonderful. Yeah, Julie, I, um, tell us a little yeah, more about your experience. To add on to what the ladies have uh, offered, that um, it's just exposure, it's opportunity, it's a chance to meet fellow writers and to share um, the challenges, the frustrations, the excitement, the joy of the journey. It's an opportunity to learn from those who um, have been on the journey much longer than you or, or those who have been on a shorter journey and, and have, you know, had great success immediately. Um, I think about, I often go to the Ohio Northern Conference, have been for years, and I remember having the opportunity to introduce Linda Sue Park. And in her presentation, she offered that when you're writing scene, and this applies to fiction or nonfiction, narrative nonfiction, is that it's, it's like a filmmaker. You have to think about what that camera is seeing and, and recording those details and sharing those details so that you're covering the senses and that, you know, so that was the first time that was presented to me, you know, really take in um, the whole environment and, and situation and relay it to the readers as a cameraman would be um, filming it for a movie scene. Um, you know, just so many wonderful experiences, opportunities. I was blessed to serve um, on faculty last year. Um, and it was before I had an agent and there was an agent there, but more so to have the opportunity to sit across from dinner with Rosemary Wells. And, um, oh my gosh, I, I just loved her. And we, we've kept in touch a little bit, you know, so that wouldn't have happened, you know, outside of that, you know, little, little, you know, fishbowl of, uh, you know, for children's literature. And so I, um, whenever I'm, and I'm often asked, and I'm sure many of you are the same, you know, 
if I want to write a children's book, you know, or I've written a children's book, what do I do? And there's three things that I offer. Keep it simple. It's join SCBWI and read and write every day. And, um, you know, that's just really what it takes is that discipline and making those connections. That's wonderful. And I believe I was in the audience for both of those conferences too, <laughs> that you were talking about. I think I've gone every year for like the past 10 years, somewhere like that too. But yes, they always have the um, best faculty speakers coming in from the publishing industry up there. And Rosemary Wells, I remember she was very entertaining for her speeches as well. She's, she's a delightful lady. Um, so a question uh, for um, all of you, whoever wants to jump in with this one. Um, so you have all been fortunate um, to um, publish um, multiple books. How has the industry changed um, since your debut came, book came out to now, just for anybody who wants to speak on that? Well, I would say it's moved a lot faster. People are putting out books more and more. Um, the indie books um, are really, really getting very popular. There's a lot of hybrid hybrid authors now which are doing both traditionally and self-publishing partly because um, the readers want books out faster and if you're traditionally published your publisher doesn't put them out as fast um, so there's a lot with uh, indie publishing now um, there's a lot more with social media I mean when I was first starting wanting to be a writer you know there was no such thing as you know Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all this and um, you know, that's, that's really daunting. And I remember a couple of years ago, there was a conversation where there was a publisher and some editors, we were, we were at a conference and I, they were talking and they said, there's a lot of authors that don't want to do social media and they didn't really want to sign them. So that's something different that you wouldn't have predicted, you know, years ago. So there's a lot where people, readers can go right to you to get to know you. You have your own platform and stuff like that. That's definitely changed um, social media, blog tours. Um, Writers are a lot more accessible now for readers than they were years ago. Before, maybe you'd write a fan letter, email, maybe you get a response. Now they can just go find you online. You can get to know people, um, which has been great. I mean, I've met readers all over the world now. You know, when I first started out, certain books really connect with certain audiences, and it's really great to, you know, meet people. I've met people in India, Pakistan, um, just all over the world. People have sent books and um, you know, to nieces and nephews and stuff like that. And it's, it's really something to see how there are certain things, certain storylines that just everybody kind of goes through. Anybody else have anything if, to add on that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if I may add, I would say the children's book industry, especially now, is very crowded. You know, you have a lot of writers and you don't have as many publishers. And a lot of the writers want very established publishers like Penguin, the big ones, right? And one thing I would say to advise anyone who is new in the industry is to be open to some of the smaller publishers because, I mean, for the well-established publishers like Penguin, you need an agent. But if you go with a smaller publisher, you could send in an unsolicited manuscript and you can also achieve your aims of becoming a published author. Yes, absolutely true. Aiko or Julie, any additional thoughts? Today, to kind of extend upon what Kristen offered is that um, less so since I, the first book came out, but more so when um, I was researching authors for a first Claire's Day 20 years ago, you know, websites, platform, it, it was not there. Um, I tried at Ohio Anna, where'd I go? I went to Ohio Anna <laughs> headquarters to look through the stacks and to find, you know, use their research to discover Ohio authors. And um, it's just really cool to see how over the last 20 years, as Kristen said, you know, just the platform, the websites, the you know, it's just the diversity of websites. It's just the, the reflection of the authors and the illustrators. It's really cool to see on the website. It's fun. Yes. Any thoughts, Psycho? My uh, first book came out year of 2016. So it's not that 
too long ago. I hope I think. <laughs> so if I if I if I think it's not really the industry is changing for me ex except this um current we are the situation we are in right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but other than that, and then also um I have uh, like four books so far, but it's every book has a different publishers. So it's more for me, like how industry changes, it's more for differences between publishers. So each time if the book land on to the publisher, I have to learn their way because mm -hmm. it's different. And it's a great experience, but it's also not lucky for me, <laughs> but, but it's, uh, it's good. And, uh, and then also I have been very bad learner for the social media. <laughs> I just cannot do too well. So, but I, I guess I'm surviving without it. So I think I'm, I'm um, if I have question, I just ask, um, ask Katharine. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> And I'm, I'm so bad at keeping up with social media too. I know we're all supposed to do that, but it's only so many hours in the day to, to write and illustrate and do, do all this, the Twitters and the Instagrams and the Facebook and yeah, it, it's a lot. So we all just do what we can. So, but yeah, definitely um, that just seems to, it seems to be one of those things that for better or worse, the social media is here to stay. So <laughs> Um, so wonderful. Um, a question, another question for everybody, and this is a fun one. So what is your favorite thing about writing for young readers? And we'll start, I'll, I'll start in the middle and I'll start with Samuel this time. I like, I like the fact that children, you know, they tend to, you know, have a sense of self in the books that they read. So if they read a book, which they can identify themselves in, in the books. It really helps them with, you know, their place in the world because everyone wants to be recognized. Even adults want to be recognized. So when children read books and they see themselves in those books, it builds them up. And I, I, like, I like seeing children saying, I see myself in this book. Yes, that's a, that's a wonderful feeling. Uh, how about Kristen? Well, when I was preteen in particular, when I was dealing with stuff at school, like friend dramas and frenemies and stuff like that, I would come home and I would escape into books. And that was like, you know, that was my safe area. And so I always used to think like, oh man, I wish I could meet these authors. I wish I could write something like this one day. So when I get those you know, messages from um, teens or a lot of times from their mom, like, oh, my daughter wrote this, she asked me to send it. And it's somebody saying that they were going through a hard time and reading the book helped like with their anxiety, they felt less alone because my characters deal with stuff. And I put little you know, tips and how they deal with it and stuff, it's just part of the story. And um, when I get those notes and stuff and I realize that I was meant to go through the things that I went through to share it to help somebody else. Um, I saw a meme just recently where it said, be the person you wish you had when you were younger. And I, so many of the young adult middle grade authors shaped me. I mean, I could list the names that made me who I am as a person. And so to be able to do that, it's like the responsibility. But, you know, I can see now that some of the embarrassing, difficult moments that you go through, if you can help somebody else that's going through that, um, you know, that definitely is, I think, a very worthwhile thing and that really makes it on the, on the tough days of writing that's what really gets you through yeah it keeps you going yeah. it's fantastic um how about julie <laughs> um well i on my website i offer that when i was little i too i was you know i'm i call myself a sporty nerd because i love to play sports and i i love to read books and sometimes you know i do them at both at the same time but um i um I would bury myself in Nancy Drew mystery stories when I was young. And I would also, I love reading inspiring stories about real people. And so no surprise, here I am. And, and I love adventure, I love travel. So 
I love sharing with children stories of individuals that they could potentially see themselves as being and to see that mm -hmm. um, many of the individuals that I write about um, had aspirations from a young age. All three of the biographies were uh, female writers, but this next story is um, women who aspired to do their sport from a young age. So I think sometimes we as adults might discount kids when they say they want to be this or they want to do that when they grow up. And the truth of the matter is many of them have it figured out a lot sooner than we give them credit for. So I think it's great to share these stories so these kids can say, you know, maybe I could just do that. Um, and, and so there, that's, that's what drives me um, in writing the stories I do. Love it. <laughs> and I go. Me, the creating the picture books, the first, um, what, what we call is dummy, the creating, the putting ideas into the little books with my illustrations and stories. It's, uh, it's kind of like express, I'm expressing my spirit and heart. Like I, I try to put everything in it and it gives me freedom. I feel so good <laughs> and I love it. But then um, um, to find the publishers uh, and then making to the final book is very, very uh, hard work. <laughs> so, but yeah. <laughs> it drains a little bit of that spirit out of it. <laughs> getting the rejections from publishers and all that stuff, but. Yeah, the rejection, I have a, um, I have a very good advice for everybody. If, uh, have you ever, this is a book, uh, old book of Robert Henley. Okay. And it's called The Art Spirit. I'm going to pop that into the chat. I think people can see what I type. So you said it's Robert Henley, H-E-N-L-Y. Uh -huh. And then I think it's, published in 1960s, very, very old book, but it's very good for if you have lots of rejections, <laughs> but you <laughs> don't want to keep your spirit, this is the book. <laughs> I recommend. <laughs> and what was it called again? So it's Robert Henley's the author, and it was called? The Art Spirit. It's, art Spirits? Uh -huh. He's a uh, professor, he was teaching art, but I think it's good for writer too, because writer also get rejections, and, but has to keep their spirits intact. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that just keep swimming attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And I have one last question for you guys as the group before we're going to open it up to the audience for a little bit of Q&A. And we are actually right exactly on time. It's just about eight o'clock. So we'll probably do 15, 20 minutes or so of audience questions. Um, I will actually let the audience know right now. You can start typing stuff in so we can kind of start queuing those up. Um, what would be helpful for me to keep track of everything is if um, people have a question to write, uh, write question all in capital letters and then write your question after that. So um, that is just a little bit easier for me to keep track of everything. So wonderful. So another group question and I'll go in reverse order that I just went. So if you are able, can you tell us a little bit about your next projects? And we'll start with Aikyo. Oh, I am, uh, um, I am working on uh, the book called um, the tentative title is Yoko and Emma. It's a friendship between Japanese girl and American girl. And it's just landed in the publisher. And then I'm working on the sketch, sketching right now, sketch right now. And then the do for the sketches this week. <laughs> and then it's supposed to be published next year. And then also, I just signed a contract for possible TV series for the Hello. Oh, wonderful. I know, wow. and then it will, it will start on, um, after the deadline for the Yoko, uh, the, the next picture book. So I'm oh, very, very- Congratulations. Excited. Thank you very much, and I'm very excited and I'm so happy to, happy to do, but yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Oh no, now I'm going to forget what order I went last time for going backwards now. I think now it's Julie. <laughs> oh, I can 
um, I, think so. I, <laughs> I alluded to it, um, but I don't want to offer any more. It's out on submission. But while while it's out on submission, I've been toying a little bit with fiction. Um, and I have also, I've written memoir sharing our journey of our loss and our celebration of our reader and all the magic that occurs at Claire's Day. Um, and I'm thinking of expanding that, rewriting it and kind of looking at it from the perspective of bereaved parents and the amazing things that they have um, accomplished in honor of their children. So stay tuned, we'll see what happens. Yes, we'll, we'll send good luck wishes for you with that one. <laughs> um, and then I think I went to Kristen, I believe. Okay. And if I got out of order, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm working on the next Cecily Taylor book, um, another YA rom-com. Cecily gets an acting job in New York. And I kind of may have caused some issues because right as I was writing the whole thing, I had New York shut down with a power outage. So she was stuck there right as it happened. So I had to stop kind of writing that scene because it was starting to kind of freak me up. Um, but yeah, so that got a little delay there, but I'm back on track with that. So um, that one, and I'm working on some adult rom-coms since I've been writing the YA ones. And then another middle grade book came out of nowhere, and I've been writing that one as well. So there'll be definitely more YA rom-coms adult ones, and now this middle grade one of a girl getting ready to go to high school and all the fears that that brings along. Yes, that, that does bring a lot of fears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's wonderful. You've got a lot on your plate. You are busy, busy little bee. <laughs> I was supposed to go to my high school reunion this summer, but of course it was canceled. And I was thinking, I was actually going with a notebook because I was hoping, because the last time I went to one of those, it brought up all those first day fears and made you feel like you were 14 again and stuff. And I was like hoping for that adrenaline <laughs> rush. <laughs> I mean, it'd be nice to see everybody too. Yeah, yeah, that too. But <laughs> <laughs> they didn't move it online, so you're all in little squares on the screen or anything. You know, they should have. They should have. <laughs> and I could have filmed the whole thing. People will do it next year. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. And you, Samuel. So I have a picture book called A Kite for Malia, which will be published in the spring of 2021. And it's really about um, love, friendship, and connection. It's also about, you know, finding a way to tell the story of life and death in a very delicate way that children can understand because life and death it's part of the same spectrum, and we need to talk about those things too. Yeah, absolutely, and it's always so hard to talk about those things in a kid-friendly sort of yeah. way. So, yeah, that yeah. would be the, wonderful that you're tackling that topic. So, excellent. Well, I have one question so far in the uh, Zoom chat. So, really, um, and remember, anybody in the audience, feel free to pop questions in. So, this one is for Ico. And they would like to know if you are a traditional or digital artist, and maybe you could talk a little bit about your process too. I am. Uh, I do. I am traditional, so I mainly do watercolor, but I use digital to fix things. <laughs> right, um, because uh, fixing watercolor is very, very hard. <laughs> I'm very glad that I have a digital manipulation that I can do. Yeah, it, is, it is not a forgiving medium <laughs> at all. So, you, I'm, I'm practicing uh, Japanese or Chinese, Japanese sumie right now. Beautiful. More dif difficult to control than watercolor. Even so. more than watercolor? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's, by practicing, it gives me freedom. Like, I can express more. So I, I, I love. I, I, I wish I'm, I'm. I can get better, and I can get better. With that. I have um. I, when I went, to, I learned the children's education when I was young, and uh, my teacher told me, "Do not underestimate the children's ability to." to tell differences, like uh, ability to tell what is beauty. So I, mm -hmm. so that's, that's just stuck in my head. So I'm trying to do my best 
but it's uh, difficult to to do with deadlines and things like that. <laughs> but yeah. yes. Um, and actually, uh, a follow up for that, um, just so because um, we've got newbies in the audience and some uh, seasoned um, kind of kidlit uh, people as well. But um, can you, since you are a traditional artist, can you let any um, people who are artists in the audience know, what do you do with your finished art for your book? Is that something that you send the full illustrations or do you, are you in charge of scanning those yourself or taking photos? Kind of how does that work with your publisher as a traditional artist? I have a, a flat bit big scanner. Mm -hmm. I scan the whole page and then uh, put it, I don't, yeah, so I submit digitally and then um, I don't, I, I don't know if there is a publisher who accepts the original art anymore. Is there? I think one or two maybe still do, but it probably depends on the artist and the publisher <laughs> and what they're used to doing. So, yeah. uh, but for the most part, I think it, a lot of it is uh, scanning things in or um, right. taking like high-res photographs yeah like professional because I, I used to have only the regular small scanner which I, I couldn't if there's a like whole spread of the art I couldn't scan so I had it I used to cut my art <laughs> before so I couldn't do that anymore so now I have a big flat scanner to scan all art I'm sure that makes things much easier for you <laughs> Yeah, right. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. All right. And now I have three questions queued up. So this first one is a question for Kristen. Any advice for male writers writing strong, authentic female protagonists? Yes, this always comes up at every conference. I'm asked this. <laughs> read, read, read. Um, the only way you're going to get the voice is if you keep reading um, and watch a lot of what teens watch too. Um, and also a lot of the shows that are teen shows like on the Disney Channel and, you know, Nick and stuff are meant for like the preteen. So keep that in mind when you're watching that, that they're actually, even though they are, you know, maybe 17, 18 years old, they, some of those shows are meant for younger kids. So you want to get the voice right there. But if you want to get an authentic teenage girl's voice, you've got to read read um, articles, read the magazines and stuff. I mean, sometimes they do use teen speak which I remember when I was a teenager reading why I'm thinking we don't talk like this. So you have to kind of, um, you know, kind of go in between that. But I also like to go on um, my reader's social media. They'll like tag me in things or I'll just, you know, see their comments and see what they're interested in, what they care about. That's, that's a big thing. That's where a lot of my books took a turn because a lot of these girls who were dealing with first time relationships weren't sure how to navigate the waters and they were dealing with stuff they were comfortable with, but they thought because they were seeing it with other people, they're online or celebrities dealing with cheating. And that was one thing that kept coming up on everybody's Instagram talking about like, is it okay, is it whatever? So I kind of came out with, you know, like the self-esteem stuff. Um, but had I not been actually paying attention to what they cared about and their voices and things like that. Um, so I would definitely say read. Um, and two, if you, if you're questioning, if you question if it's authentic, maybe get, you know, see if you have some people that you know that have teenage daughters that could read it as beta readers to kind of see if you're getting it. And if you have any qu questions where you're not sure if you're getting it, maybe step back and see if this is, you know, the right voice, because sometimes if you try to push it too hard, it's not coming across authentic. But definitely watch, read as much as you can, and find out what kids are actually reading, not just what they, you know, people tell you is the hot new book. Find out what actually they are reading, because sometimes you'll be surprised what they have online that makes you think everybody's reading, and then you go on these bookstagram accounts and you find out everybody's reading different books completely. <laughs> Excellent answer. Yes, uh, writing Kidlet is definitely fun in that you can watch uh, movies and TV and they really are excellent research for, you know, learning what those age groups like. So, excellent. So don't, don't forget that everybody in the audience, it's, it's okay to watch TV and, and movies. <laughs> you can say it's for research. <laughs> so another one, um, this is, I think, for everybody. So how did you decide what genre you should write? I feel like I'm writing in the right category, but the wrong stories, if that makes sense. Is 
so I suppose maybe that's like a like maybe the subject matter might be older or younger than the um, category if maybe well, kind of going back to what Kristen was saying earlier with the MG and the YA. Yeah, I would say study the market. Um, if you have somebody that you can have take a look at it or run it by, um, for me, when I was starting, I was writing, I mean, there was no new adult category when I was first starting it before I was sending anything out. And I showed it to a couple of professors and one said, I really think young adult is where this should go and stuff. So sometimes all you need is somebody else to look at it with fresh eyes and they'll see it right there. Um, but I would definitely read, see what other books are doing. I'm in a couple of different groups for YA and middle grade. And in the middle grade group in particular, people will come in and they will say stuff and you kind of just kind of stop and think, and you know they haven't been reading and researching. So um, in most cases though, like sometimes you're just a little bit too close to the project and getting some fresh eyes on it of somebody who reads um, is, is usually enough. Excellent. And I will actually add on to that, that um, doing critiques at conferences um, with professionals are a very good way as well to kind of get that um, kind of additional viewpoint, um, especially from a professional. Um, I, my very first novel I was working on, I was convinced it was YA until I went to a conference and an editor told me, or I'm sorry, an agent told me that, uh, no, it was a middle grade. And I didn't, I was like, well, let's, no, I think it's a YA. And then I went and did some, you know, dove into some middle grade books. And I was like, I love this. It totally is a middle grade. And I didn't even know it. So um, yeah, it's definitely good to get um, some readers when you're, you know, a little bit unsure um, and, you know, kind of bounce from there and you might end up uh, learning something that, you know, you like even better than what you thought you were doing. So um, let's see, another question over here. I've got questions in two places going back and forth. Um, so this is for all panelists. Um, what is your writing process? Do you outline ahead of time or are you a pantser? And for the picture book authors, how many drafts do you tend to write? I'll say when it comes to picture books, you, you want to refine it, you know, so, you know, people fall, fall in love with their stories and, you know, the first draft, they feel like, oh, this is perfect, but it, it's never perfect. You know, you can take some time away, come to it, refine it, make sure the, the, the language you are using is, is right, make sure you, you have as less as possible the number of words you need to convey your your messages and this comes with you know sometimes getting away from the story maybe leaving it somewhere for two weeks three weeks and coming back to it with a fresh mind and making sure that the picture book is actually structured the way it should be you know there's a way picture books are written and I remember when I first wrote the first draft for Macy's Scrap Book, my aim was for it to be for children between the age of, let's say, one to eight years. But then the language I was using was really for children who were, let's say, 10 years and older. So I, I spoke to a writing coach who, you know, told me, okay, you are using the wrong kind of language, you are using an older language. And with her guide, I was able to refine the story and, and now we have a, a published book. I would say um, you know, it's a little different with nonfiction. As much as I'd like to be a pantser fly by the seat of the Um, Well, it, do, it does happen. I mean, you do, again, in a proposal, you generally have chapter outline. And one doesn't have to remain with the chapter outline, but it, it kind of lays out the story. Um, for me, the fun is when, um, and I typically begin with the research, and I, you know, primary resources, I talk about letters, interviews, you know, even though it's been written in a book, it can be wrong in the book. And even though the internet is a great source of information, um, there is oftentimes misinformation on the internet. So I'm always very good about double checking sources and again, getting primary sources as much as possible. 
And that's for me where the fun comes in is where I think that I might have a sense of where a chapter might go or where the story, and then I find, get that aha moment and I find something through my research that really just kind of throws a whole nother different angle into the story. So um, there's a lot of plotting, but then a little bit of pantsing along the way. Wonderful. Aiko, how about you? Am I, do I need light? Am I disappearing in the dark? You are a little dark now. <laughs> Can I go get light? Sure. <laughs> I'm so sorry, very sorry. We'll, we'll jump to Kristen while you're getting your light on. So Kristen, are you a plotter or a pantser? <laughs> I'm a little of each. I have, if I turn the camera, you'd faint, but I've got just stacks of notebooks. I start out in a notebook, um, you know, and I, when I'm writing a series book, I need to have a little bit of an idea of where I'm going, but I have found if I outline too much, I run out of gas on writing the story. And when I'm a pantser and I'm kind of like, I have a little bit of an idea of where I'm going, um, I discover more things about the character and more things come out. And I, that's what I found with the Cecily Taylor series where I never intended for Andrew Holiday, the big pop star songwriter, to have anxiety. But as I was writing and getting to know him, he told me what his story was. I didn't, I didn't get to move him around the way I wanted to. And with Cecily, she became very concerned with all these causes. She wants to save the world. You know, the polar bears, that's one of her causes. The next thing is going to be um, the Syrian refugees and something. And that just came, you know, I've always been concerned about that. And one day I heard, well, she's concerned about that and you haven't talked about that and I thought oh okay I didn't realize sorry <laughs> and so that just took the story in a whole new way because it does it shows who she is it shows why she is the way she is but when I was originally coming up with the story did I think that that was going to make it in you know she's this you know trying to be an actress in New York and do all this stuff and have her dream job and juggle school and everything else and yet there's all these other parts of their personality that come out, how they deal with things, how they deal with anxiety, how they help their friends. Um, and then the, the pressures when you're, you know, um, social media famous, these kind of things are coming out in the next book. And so if I kind of just let the character do and kind of get out of the way, which I did an independent study when I was in college with um, Professor Tom Foster, who wrote, you know, how to read like a professor. And he always said, let your characters talk to you. Whenever I got stuck, he'd be like, cause you're not letting your characters talk to you. And that's like the best advice, get out of the way. You know, they, they know the story that they want to tell. And it's probably somewhere in your subconscious, but if you try to push it too far, that's when, that's when I always get blocked. Mm -hmm. So I kind of need to know where I'm going, but it's definitely very, very loose. And I can't stress enough about the, the notebooks because when you have even a little idea, maybe you aren't sure what you're going to do with it, but write it down because you will not remember it. So his voice is talking to you again. <laughs> I know, don't tell my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and... Aiko, how many drafts do you usually have with your picture books? I, uh, it's a lot. And it's <laughs> usually um, involved uh, revisions, it's like hundreds of revisions. Eh? That, that, um, it's usually start in my kitchen. The stories and ideas and uh, images start, start in my kitchen. So whenever uh, things popping up in my head, um, I'm... Uh, I just um, like uh, like Christian said, uh, I just write it down uh, mm. and uh, me, uh, put the, me, uh, put it on my wall so that I won't forget. And then later I just collect them and um, do the puzzles and put them together. Do you send them to your agent once it's in dummy form, or do you send her um, more like just like type notes and sketches or? Um, dummy form, but dummy form. Then, uh, she asked me to, to send her, her uh, text, so, right, <laughs> I guess it's both. Perfect. Yeah. I've, I've got two more questions here, and um, then we'll uh, do a final question for me to wrap up, um, but if anybody does have any final thoughts or uh, burning questions or anything, just pop them in there. Um, so this will be last call for questions. Um, so this one is for uh, Samuel. How do you balance honoring the truth of a traditional fol folklore tale while making it uniquely your own? Okay. Can you repeat the question again? Yep. How do you balance honoring the truth of a traditional folklore tale with making it uniquely your own? 
Well, okay. So when it comes to the Anansi stories in Ghana, everyone knows those stories. You cannot really take ownership of those stories. And um, the, the only way you can make it your own is to keep it authentic, but yet, yet still think a bit outside the box. Let the character do things that maybe they might not do traditionally in, in, in those stories. Like in Macy's scrapbook, um, the, the hero of the story, which was Afia, and Macy was trying to emulate Afia in, in the story. And in that story, Afia was riding a bull, chasing Anansi in his flying basket, right? But in, in, in the Ghanaian Anansi story, there's no mention of any bull rider in, the, in, in our traditional stories about Anansi. So the aspect of Afia, who Macy is trying to be like, riding a bull, is something I created. And I have ownership of it because no one tells any story about, you know, Anansi being chased by a girl riding a bull. You know, so you have to kind of keep the the authenticity of the of the of the story, but yet still find a way to think outside the box and make it your own. That's wonderful. Put your own spin on it. <laughs> yes, yes. Fantastic. And this is a question for everybody. I think this is our last audience question, unless anything else pops up. So. Um, for, you know, obviously we've got the pandemic going on right now. Um, and a lot of people have been um, having a hard time feeling creative with everything going on in the world. Um, how has it affected um, any of you? Are you feeling it easier to write, um, more difficult, um, or maybe just things moving slower in the industry? Um, so how has this kind of world situation affected you and your writing and illustration work and creativity. It's a toughie. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, at the very beginning, I was writing and then um, took a <laughs> deep little break. Um, so I always joke, like, is it time to hide the eggs? Are we putting up the tree? Like what day, day is it? I don't even know anymore. Um, but I took a lot of time to read, um, kind of get back to, um, Reading, I took a little break from the story because like I said, it was set in New York at the time and I had friends who were there going through stuff and it just, to get into that world, it was just a little bit too difficult. Um, so I started working on just like some projects more for, for fun. Um, I started reading a lot more and then um, doing, signed up for a writing conference that I knew would end up going online. Um, and that, I wrote a little bit about that on Instagram, I think it was yesterday about how doing online writing conferences right now is a really great thing because it takes your mind off things and you go at a slower pace. And that's been really, really helpful doing some of those. I've done a couple of them. Um, and I think really right now, you can't be too hard on yourself. I mean, every writing group I'm in right now is talking about that. Like there's some people that, you know, and this might be a time to fill up the creative well too, because that's a huge important part of writing. You know, watching movies that inspire you, listening to music or just, building up thinking about what you might want to write on. So I think if you force that that's not necessarily the right way to go, um, you know, it's some days it's a little slower going, but you know, when you're a writer too, you, you have to be disciplined and stuff. So I think some of us are still kind of going back a little bit more because we're just kind of used to it. Um, so, you know, I, ha I have been writing, it's been a different process, but if you can kind of, you know, escape a little bit. Now there are some writers this one writer, um, Sandra Suko, she uh, writes historical Regency romance, and um, she's got some contemporary too. She's just been going. She is like an inspiration to me. She is just continuing to write. You know, she's cheerful. She acknowledges that this is a difficult time. Um, then there's other writers who are just escaping with it, which I think is great. Sometimes it's a little hard for me to turn my brain off that way. Sometimes I can. You know, sometimes that, you know, 
maybe you might find the best thing that you're writing right now is during the pandemic because you are escaping. Um, you know, a lot of great art has been made that way. And there's, um, I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, I get their newsletters all the time. I can message you later if you want to put it on a website. I, I brain pickings or something like that. And they have a lot of um, essays from different writers and artists who have gone, poets who have gone through difficult times talking about like art and things that have been made, going through things, you know, a difficult things, like maybe not a pandemic, but sometimes they do go back in history and you can see how other people have dealt with it. So, you know, maybe just write something for fun too and you don't know where that could take off. Absolutely. I've been um, reading a lot too. I, I shared with a writing friend, I feel like this summer has been a summer of percolating. Um, I think that between having the one book on submission and having great hope for that, um, but meanwhile, stepping back, um, reading, a lot of books on craft, reading um, a lot of books on memoir, writing, reading. I read a lot of biographies and memoir anyways. Um, I've also been taking advantage of FCDWI and Highlights Foundation. We're offering a lot of great online um, interviews with authors. And um, so again, back to those great resources. So just using them, I think that um, even though we might not be writing at the time, we're preparing for that next. And I think that, as Kristen said, I think it's a great time to kind of give yourself a little permission just to maybe step back, as Richard Peck would say, put that manuscript in the drawer and maybe, you know, feed your soul, feed your spirit, um, feed your muse, and then who knows what's going to come out of it. So that's kind of where I am. It's wonderful advice. I go over Samuel, anything to add? One day I, um, this is true story, and one day I went to, in the beginning of pandemic, I went to grocery shopping, and I was so shocked that there's no toilet paper in the <laughs> <laughs> And it made me think, what is important for me? I just really, really thought about what is really asset for me, what is important for me, am I, I would just ask myself, am I keep writing and illustrating, like making art, even there's no toilet paper <laughs> in the world? What is important for me? And then I, I just ask myself for every single day, and the answer was yes. So I just kept doing. And then, so I thought, oh, why don't I take this? time for uh, advantage, like uh, making it uh, to find a silver lining for this situation. So I started, uh, I play music, cello. So I just uh, find, uh, uh, viola. I find a teacher who play viola in uh, Columbus Symphony Orchestra. I never thought I was going to be able to learn from him. And it's just one of my dream came true, and it's just, um, it's uh, it's um, it's so blessing. And yes, the situation is bad, but we can make it to something good, can we? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Great attitude. That's kind of how we felt about the meetings being moved online is it's yeah. a bummer not being able to see people in person. But on the other hand, we get the whole entire region now can uh, join in as well as anybody from around the world if they really want to. So it's been kind of a unique way to, to connect while not connecting at the same time. It's been, it's, it's, you know, wonderful that we can bring in, you know, so many new online viewers. So, <laughs> and Samuel, any thoughts? <laughs> I'll say it's, it's been difficult to get haircuts nowadays because, you know, that is true. everything is closed. Yeah. But then, you know, one thing about this pandemic is, you know, you, you get to spend more time with your family and you also spend more time with yourself. And when you spend more time with yourself, you're able to, you know, connect with the things that are important to you. And if it's a story that you want to write, you know, you're writing it from a great foundation. I know most of the book events that I usually go to, 
I had maybe three story times lined up, but you know, because of what's been going on, they've been canceled and hopefully, you know, things will go back to normal. Yeah, hopefully one of these days we'll all be able to do things in person again, but we sure are all getting creative <laughs> about ways to do things online. <laughs> so, <laughs> when there's a will, there's yeah. a way. So, yeah. Except online haircuts. I haven't, I haven't seen those come around yet, but, you know, <laughs> I'm sure someone will figure it out at some point. <laughs> so, um, one last question snuck in for everybody, um, and this is um, just for if there are any um, book recommendations on craft or writing, any additional ones that you guys recommend? <laughs> yes, but I have to turn around for a minute. <laughs> I was going to say, I've got like my whole self here I could bring out too. I would say Bird by Bird is one of the best writing books for anyone of any genre or it, I mean, it just breaks things down simply. I think that um, there are um, writing picture books and books on writing, you know, for children. But I think in general, for any writer, you should read um, Bird by Bird. Yes. Um, I was just going to share, when I was um, taking creative writing class, my professor suggested we look at the Paris Review interviews with different authors. And um, a couple years ago, somebody gave me this for Christmas. And reading these interviews with um, authors from you know, years ago, Hemingway's in here, Fitzgerald's in here. There's a lot of very helpful information in these. And I, it's one of like the best gifts I ever got. I was, um, the perfect time to, I had lost a friend that weekend and this arrived early. And I just spent the entire weekend going through those. And also if you're a writer, sometimes you're a little different and these can make you feel like you found your crew, you found your group, you know, you found your tribe right here. And this, <laughs> so I would recommend these. Um, there's a lot of great craft books. There's one, um, I can never remember the title of it and it's in the living room. That's what I was looking for behind me. Um, I think it's called The Art of the Call. It's very much like the Julia Cameron artist way, but it just kind of talks about um, not worrying so much about what's gonna happen with the book from your end but putting the art out there and just, you know, trying to help, you know, you write the story that you think is going to help and, you know, you get it out there and you don't worry so much about how it's going to reflect back on you, what you're going to get out of it, but what the reader is going to get out of it. And when I read that book, it was when I was starting to send out two colors again. It changed my entire perspective of publishing, marketing, everything. And I got my first contract right after that. And I think it's because I had a shift in my priorities and I was no longer about what the book could do for me, but what the book could do for somebody else. And I always say that that, it did not go over when I mentioned to my writing group. I will say that they were all like, no, 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 you know, <laughs> we're here to get published, we're here this. And I was like, oh, I kind of, you know, felt like a little hippie at that point, kind of, you know, shriveled up a little bit. But it was right after that, that my next query, everything really started falling into place for me. So. I think that that is, you know, a valuable way to look at it. And that's just what worked for me. I've got big magic on my shelf too. I've always thought that one was I really too. good. Although I'm forgetting who it's by. It yeah. is by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gilbert. Gilbert. Yes. <laughs> yep, I had to go. I've got shelves here you guys can't see. <laughs> but my craft books are here. <laughs> We're surrounded by books. All right, and then to finish us up, I've got one last question for everybody. And you're getting lots of thank yous from everybody on both the Zoom chat as Did anybody else have any craft books that they wanted to share, writing books on writing that they felt inspired by? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I asked that as well as somebody said that um, Catherine was going to ask about any publishing wisdom that you might share with the group as well. So you could answer either or either of those things. Well, I would say never give up. <laughs> never ever ever give up just keep just keep writing just keep trying just keep submitting just keep querying um and and then once you know just just keep going um because 
to, to not keep going means that you won't have the opportunity to, you know, have have those stories shared and to fulfill your dreams. So you just gotta keep plugging away at it. Is there anything that you wish you had known at the beginning as well, Julie? Um, gosh, I, again, because my journey was so, I mean, I, I came to know so many authors and illustrators and to see things from their perspective. So I, um, I think I came from it from a different direction. And then being on the other side of the table, it made me, as a festival organizer, it made me really appreciate um, how hard they work, how dedicated they are, and uh, the significance of school visits and um, you know the income for um, an author. So with Claire's Day, we began into year three the school visit program. So I think that um, I, I was quite aware of what the world I was entering into um, before I got into it on the other side, and I'm just really grateful. Great. Anybody else? The best okay. advice, I'm sorry. No, wait, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, the best advice that I got early on was whatever genre you want to write in, read a hundred books in that genre before you get started so that you really know what you're, what you're doing. And um, I always called that my summer of YA and my summer of middle grade. Um, my friend Anna joined me in that, even though she wasn't intending to be a writer. And we had so much fun. We read books from when we were that age, classics, the new stuff. And um, I would say, you know, if, if you're going to do it, read the books that inspired you to want to write, to find out what it was in there that brought that spark out. Read the new stuff, read the classics, read the stuff that everybody's going on about, even if you don't care for it, it's not, you know, quite your cup of tea, you know. And um, don't lose your voice. Don't try to imitate somebody else's voice because we all have something to say. We all have a story and don't lose sight of that just because the market is saying that this is selling really big. You know, your voice is important and you have a story that needs to be told. Perfect. So I would say- uh, if, if I have, okay. Oh no, please. <laughs> Go ahead. Ladies first. Okay, thank you. For me, um, for any job, I think it's uh, writing and illustrating is um, mentally, physically, spiritually demanding, and it's very hard. So, uh, my tip is to create very healthy workplace so that you can be comfortable for a long time <laughs> and then also um, be in the nature to keep your spirit um, high and like uh, energize yourself i think nature helps us to energize our uh, energy so uh, or like uh, spirit and heart so i think it's uh, important but yeah it's a uh, it's, it's very important to to ha have a good, healthy workplace. Perfect. Samuel, Samuel, still there? Yeah. yeah. The only thing I'll say, especially to um, the, the new writers, is, you know, don't be so caught up in, you know, your feelings when you get rejected because of, let's say, sending a story to a publisher and and this is a story which is a child of your mind and i'm sure you, you are really in love with your child but then the fact that a publisher does not want to publish that story does not mean another publisher won't publish it so don't don't i've seen people online and on on social media getting very depressed because their stories were rejected and you cannot, you know, think this way. If one door closes, another one will open. So just look at all your options. So true. And it looks like Catherine is back. <laughs> I am. I am so sorry. I don't know why it kicked me out and why it wouldn't let me back on. My internet was having some issues apparently. So <laughs> yeah, I think Samuel's frozen now. Yeah, he is. So thankfully, at least we can hear him. <laughs> yes, we can hear him, but it looks like his screen is all dark over here. But 
oh well, I guess that's technology for you. <laughs> so thank you very much, Becky, for, for jumping in on Oh, no my problem. Behalf. I basically asked the last question I think you're going to ask, uh, you know, about their, their uh, uh, what, the, what advice they would have had have for us all. So other than that, I will turn it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so very much. And for anybody who doesn't know, Becky is the uh, illustrator coordinator for our chapter. So Again, thank you, Becky, for hopping in. So um, sorry I missed the final question, but I am sure your answers were all very lovely, and I will look forward to watching those on the replay. And I'm also sorry that we lost Samuel over here, although we can still hear him, but he is now a black screen for us. <laughs> so um, for anybody watching the replay, this will be kind of interesting as well, as I think we've watched all of us go from sunset to kind of darkness in our houses. <laughs> so, well. Uh, thank you all so much again for joining us tonight. Um, again, our panelists were Kristen Lindsay Hager, Aiko Ekigami, Samuel Nar, and Julie Verbini. Uh, don't forget to pick up copies of their books from the Bookloft of German Village website at bookloft.com. Also, a thank you to all of the Ohio Women Book Festival sponsors and partners again. And thank you all so very much for joining us. Uh, we hope everyone will check out the Ohioana website for more amazing festival programming like tonight's panel. There are tons and tr I, trust me when I say this, tons and tons of awesome events taking place in the coming weeks um, and the last weekend in August. Uh, so be sure you guys check that out. Um, it'll be featuring authors and illustrators from all across Ohio. Um, there are 140 authors and illustrators and I believe everybody is doing something. So it'll be lots of good things for everybody to watch and there will be some more live panels um, taking place as well leading up to the festival um, and on the festival weekend. You can see everything on um, the full schedule on ohioana.org and register for live events on Eventbrite. So again, thank you so very much uh, everyone for joining us this evening. And for bearing with us during our technical difficulties. <laughs> thank goodness it was at the end and not the beginning or middle. So, but thank you so much, everyone. Always lovely seeing you and good night. Good night. Thank you.